Good evening, New York, and welcome to everyone tuning in from around the world. My name is Nicholas Manousis. I'm the Executive Director of the Horological Society of New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our November lecture. Because of the pandemic, all of HSNY's lectures and classes will be virtual for the foreseeable future. While we miss seeing everyone in person, we are happy to turn this difficult situation into a positive way forward. At the end of tonight's lecture, we will have time for questions. You can submit your questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. It's about that time of year. This holiday season gives the gift of horology. Horological Society of New York membership and classes make wonderful gifts for the watch or clock enthusiast in your life. And of course, all members receive HSNY's exclusive lapel pin, which you can see I'm wearing tonight. Visit our website for more details. You can see the web address on the top of your screen. Now on to tonight's lecture. Since 1960, Grand Seiko has been crafting incredible movements in quartz, spring drive, and mechanical calibers. While Grand Seiko offers these various movement types, it is the purely mechanical movements that are the beating heart of Grand Seiko. Tonight, we'll take a close look at Grand Seiko's philosophy in mechanical watchmaking with Joe Kirk, Brand Curator and National Training Manager for Grand Seiko Corporation of America. Joe will be joined by special guests, Mr. Akio Naito and Takuma Kawachiya. Take it away, Joe. Thank you, Nick. A pleasure to be back. I uh, you know, wish it was in a live format as we had done last year uh, when we presented Spring Drive. Of course, you know, with the situation, uh, you know, not possible, but, you know, we're wishing everyone well and hoping that uh, making, you know, making do in, in the current situation. But uh, with that said, we'll get into tonight's lecture. So, Kodo, it's the beating heart of Grand Seiko, as Nick mentioned. Grand Seiko was born in 1960. Its manually wound 3180 caliber had a pulse, a heartbeat. In Japanese, that's known as Koro. This was the brand's start. And as we celebrate 60 years of Grand Seiko, we honor the past by continuing the tradition of hand assembling and adjusting fine mechanical timepieces with the experience and know-how passed down from generation to generation of Grand Seiko watchmakers. It's through this tradition that Grand Seiko has built a name and reputation for itself, first in Japan, and then later the rest of the world. While we've continued to pursue advancements in other forms of watchmaking, such as quartz, or our own proprietary movement type spring drive, which you may have learned about last year when we lectured at Horological Society of New York, We've made innovative strides in many forms of watchmaking, but we have kept the purely mechanical timepieces very close to our hearts. So today's lecture is going to focus on the beating heart of Grand Seiko, its mechanical calibers, as well as the introduction to the new 9S A5 caliber, and our concept creation, the T0. I hope you're as excited as I am. All right, so to start, we'll start with the first Grand Seiko. As most watches of its era, the first Grand Seiko caliber, the 3180, was 18,000 beats per hour. This movement was made to be the best ever created by our two factories, Seiko Sha, and it was the first watch in Japan to be tested compliant within the chronometer standard of the time. By the launch of the second Grand Seiko, you started to see the evolution in practicality, such as a quick set date or increased water resistance in the watch itself. But inside, the basic principles stayed the same. 
the caliber 430 was changed to the 5722A, which really had no change in terms of its overall design. However, in 1966, we introduced the 5722B, and we increased its heart rate, or its heartbeat, to 19,800 beats per hour. This increase allowed for greater stability, as well as the introduction of the Grand Seiko standard, which was a testing criteria that was made to exceed that of chronometer. Starting in 1964, our manufacturers Sua Seikosha and Daini Seikosha started to participate in chronometer competitions in Switzerland at the Neuchâtel Observatory. The movement pictured, the caliber 052 by Daini Seikosha came in two variants, one with 10 beats per second or 36,000 beats per hour, and the other with 20 beats per second or 72,000 beats per hour. Frequencies of up to 50 beats per second, or 180,000 beats per hour, were experimented with by Sua Seikosha. But ultimately, it was determined that 10, 15, and 20 beats per second were ideal for performance in the competitions. In 1967, the Caliber 052 helped Daini Seikosha win second in series prize at the Neuchatel Observatory competition and the R45 contributed to Sua Seikosha's taking third. After the competition was held in 1967, the mechanical wrist chronometer segment of the event was canceled in Neuchatel. Instead, Sua Seikosha competed in the 1968 Geneva Observatory competition. There, their final score was 58.19 out of 60. It gave them fourth through 10th place overall. And while Quartz had occupied Sua Seikosha's, uh, Quartz had occupied first through third, Sua Seikosha's high frequency calibers achieved the highest score ever recorded in the Geneva Observatory's competition, at least in the mechanical wrist chronometer segment, which was a huge, huge accomplishment for Sua Seikosha. If that score were converted to the Neuchatel system, where the goal was to achieve a score of zero, the score would have been 1.33 which would have been the best in Neuchatel's history as well. The proof of stability in the chronometer competitions helped the two Sua Seikosha factories determine that high frequency or high beat contributed to great performance. In 1968, Grand Seiko introduced three new 10 beat calibers. The 45 GS, a manually wound caliber from Daini Seikosha, the 61GS, an automatic 10-beat caliber from Sua Seikosha. And then the 19GS, which was from Daini Seikosha and very petite ladies high beat 36,000. Though the competitions had ended in Neuchatel, the observatory would still certify movements through its rigorous 45-day testing period. And that exceeded the, the test of a standard chronometer at the time. Daini Seikosha submitted a total of 283 45 GS calibers. At first, it was the 4520 series, and then later the 4580, between 1968 and 1970. And a total of 226 passed. Near all of these were sold to the public. It's important to mention that these were not sold as Grand Seiko. They were sold as Seiko, Astronomical Observatory Chronometer, officially certified, and yes, as you can see, it said all of that on the dial, but uh, you may ask why. Is it using the Grand Seiko movement, but it's branded as Seiko? And really the simple answer is it wasn't tested to the Grand Seiko standard. So with that said, we wanted to create a higher degree of Grand Seiko standard. It pushed us to seek out more advanced testing, right? And this new standard was the highest quality ever produced for Grand Seiko at the time. It was even one of the most strictest standards in the world, the most strict standards in the world. This testing criteria became known as VFA, or the very fine adjusted. It was used in small quantities of watches across these high beat calibers that I had mentioned previously. 
the 45 GS VFA and the 61 GS VFA were rated to plus or minus two seconds per day or one minute per month. Then we had the ladies 19 GS VFA. Now this was rated within plus uh, six seconds to negative three seconds per day or plus or minus two minutes per month. Right? And that was a tremendous challenge due to the small size of the caliber as well as the small size of the balance wheel. All right, so what's the benefit of high frequency? Here you can see an eight beat and a 10 beat frequency and it's a lot to look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and slow this down a little bit at about a 10th of speed. So we don't go crazy trying to look at that uh, for a couple of minutes. <laughs> so stability, as I mentioned, is one of the key contributing factors to why high frequency gives a stable rate, right? When considering watches of today, most have a frequency of 28,800 beats per hour. And this was a high frequency. This was a high beat back in the 60s because most of the watches were 18,000 beats per hour. Today, 28,800 has become industry standard. This faster pace compared to the past is very stable. But in comparison, the high beat 36,000 is even more so. So a higher beat increases the stability and resistance to shock and vibration. Right? If you think of two tops, and they're both spinning on a table. Right, one's going slow, one's going fast. The one that's spinning slow, if shock occurs, is likely to fall. If it's spinning fast, it can recoup itself. It can regain its stability. Now, this in a watch, it improves higher stability. And of course, when the shock occurs, it's going to keep a more consistent rate because of that. Now, it also helps in position change. So this is beneficial with the faster frequency with the, with the watch changing positions. The challenge, of course, with high frequency, and I think most of you may know this, is this high collision of a high beat caliber really is a lot of uh, stress on the movement. It wears down components faster and it eats up the lubricant faster, right? It also requires higher torque output. So Unfortunately, the power reserve is generally shorter of that of the lower beat. Now, by the mid 1970s, production of Grand Seiko mechanical calibers kind of fell to the wayside in uh, the success of quartz. So, unfortunately, the focus went to quartz calibers, but that was, of course, very important for the brand. And Grand Seiko kind of faded. It was in 1988 that Grand Seiko reappeared for the first time, but this time it was a quartz movement the 95 GS. So 1988 saw the reintroduction of Grand Seiko, but it was quartz now. In just a few short years, we introduced in 1993, the 9F. Right? And this was the pinnacle of precision, legibility, and durability never before seen in the quartz watch. However, it'd still be some time before we see the revival of mechanical GS. So the drive and motivation was strong to bring it back, right? The main designer, Koichiro Jujo, uh, his team developed an entirely new movement using CAD CAM, which wasn't as common at the time. And uh, this allowed for the ability to come to market in just three short years. This was much faster than ways of the past, obviously. In November of 1998, Grand Seiko launched its first new mechanical caliber in about 25 years, the 9S. The 9S marked a new era for Grand Seiko mechanical calibers. It was something collectors in Japan had been longing for. And keep in mind, that's because it was only sold in Japan at the time. The development of the 9S series brought forth a new criteria for the Grand Seiko standard as well. It was modernized and improved upon compared to the past, but it still exceeded the criteria for chronometer. The testing criteria for the modern Grand Seiko standard is set at an average daily rate of negative three to plus five seconds per day. The testing is done in six positions. This is opposed to the five of COSC certification, which has a mean daily rate of negative four to plus six seconds per day. Due to the sixth position, 
in the Grand Seiko standard, it became a 17 day test instead of 15. Now the movements are also tested in three temperatures, just as they do in COSC certification. All right, and cost the temperature test uh, for variance is uh, from eight to 38 degrees Celsius. Now we do that test, but we also do a test from 23 to 38, which is not part of COSC certification. So this also helps us assure that the maximum rate variation is plus or minus 0.5 seconds per day, as opposed to COSC's 0.6. So for the 9S5 series, a new escapement and balance was developed. The use of a forearm annular balance was utilized to help minimize the effects from temperature, and it was not common of Seiko products of that time. And the frequency was set at 28,800 beats per hour, and that was selected to contribute to the stability, of course. The 9S5 series started a new generation of movements that in the near future would open up a window to all sorts of different possibilities. Grand Seiko's 9S5 series had contributed to many great benefits in terms of the durability and longevity, uh, as well as high performance and accuracy. The goal, however, was to eventually improve on its practicality. So in 2006, we introduced the 9S67. Right, this featured a three-day power reserve for the first time ever in a Grand Seiko mechanical movement. Now, What's also kind of neat about this, and uh, if you're familiar with Grand Seiko, this is also the first design to incorporate our Ridges of Mount Iwate dial texture, which was designed by a uh, renowned designer for us, Nobuhiro Kasugi. Mr. Kasugi uh, designed this dial depicting his vision of Mount Iwate as if he were viewing it from directly above. Now, the movement designer was Takoro Tsuyoshi. And Tsuyoshi was involved with the development of the 9S67, and his emphasis was to really look at every component and maximize the efficiency as much as possible in order to improve the duration. The 9S67 had changed the barrel and the mainspring to improve the power reserve. It also uh, had changed the balance staff thickness. So the uh, thickness had increased from 0 0.07 millimeters to 0 0.08. And while it seems small, that actually contributed to an uh, increase in strength of the part by about 30%. Now, 9S5 series also utilized the magic lever, the Paul lever system uh, in the 9S55. And we changed that in the 9S67 to a reverser gear system. So in the 9S5 series, we had the magic lever, right? A Paul lever that was originally created by Seiko in 1959. And we use it for bidirectional winding. And it's a brilliant mechanism and super efficient and very uh, minimal parts, actually. So for this particular uh, winding system, as the rotor turns in one direction, the uh, pull, pull it A is pulling on the wheel, while the uh, push bullet B is uh, pushing the wheel. So no matter what direction the rotor is turning, this highly efficient system is winding the watch. However, in order to keep the size down uh, in the same size, actually, as the, as the 9S5 series, we had to implement a reverser gear system. So the reverser gear system uh, was the first time that we had utilized, basically, for this particular uh, style, this generation of, of Grand Seiko. And it's commonly, this type of system, I should say, is commonly used uh, across many brands. But one of the biggest concerns for it is the wear and tear. And so through different processes, we actually uh, utilize either heat or different plating treatments in order to increase the hardness of these components, increasing its longevity and durability. So that was a big part of the breakthrough uh, in order for us to implement this reverse gear system and also retain the longevity that Grand Seiko has been renowned for. So that was a big contributing factor. And we also utilized it in order to keep the size smaller. So in 2009, Grand Seiko made for the first time in roughly 40 years, an entirely new high beat 36,000 caliber. 
The launch of the 9S85 was a new achievement for Grand Seiko watchmaking and brought back the high frequency segment. Due to developments in new Spron spring alloys, which we use for our, uh, all of our Grand Seiko mechanical watches and also in spring drive if you watched the lecture last year, um, we also added new developments such as MEMS manufacturing. Through these two new things and many others, and of course the determination of our Grand Seiko team, we were able to introduce this new high beat 36,000 9S85. So to share some of the technical features of, of the 9S85 or the 9S8 series in general, we utilize a single barrel in order to keep the diameter the same size as the 9S55, the 9S5 series. So we utilize only one barrel. However, the spring inside is the latest iteration of Spron alloy. So this is our proprietary uh, spring alloy. And it took us about six years to develop. Despite the high frequency that co consumes one and a half times the torque or the energy that a typical eight beat would, right? The 9S8 series achieved a high power reserve of 55 hours when the 9S5 series was only 50. So this is one and a half times the power consumption, yet a longer duration. It wasn't just because of that though. Also through the adaptation of MEMS or microelectromechanical systems, right? For our conventional lever escapement, uh, this aided in many different ways to the possibility of creating a new high beat 36,000. So MEMS Liga uh, carries over from semiconductor manufacturing of which we have experience with since the early days of quartz watchmaking. So nearly about four decades. Through this precise electroforming process, we're able to create components with 10 times the precision of conventional machining methods. And it's with this knowledge that we're able to create these complex designs that allow for skeletonized parts that are substantially lighter weight. As the parts were more lightweight, there was more stability thanks to the decrease in energy loss. To give you an idea of the true size, this pallet fork is only about two millimeters in length. As you can see it lined up next to the tweezers. And it's funny because Seiko had strived to reduce the weight of the escapement since the 1960s. And that was a big, big factor uh, in, in contributing to Grand Seiko watchmaking. And now thanks to MEMS, the possibilities are really endless. It allows for these parts that are smoother so they reduce friction and we're talking half to one fifth the roughness of conventional parts. It also allows for the parts to have high hardness, 15% higher than conventional parts, right? That helps improve the longevity. Now, something you may notice if you look very closely is this little step, which is actually a reservoir or lubricant retention, all right? So at the end of every tooth in the escape wheel, we have this step. And it helps retain the lubricant over a longer course of time. It basically builds a little pool in that step and the design captures the oil and slowly distributes it over the uh, sliding surface of the escape wheel tooth. This helps increase the durability and longevity of the lubricant itself. Pretty neat. So the hairspring for the 9S85 was also updated to the latest Spron alloy. So this is a nickel cobalt based alloy, which was under development for five years in collaboration with the Research Institute uh, for Electromagnetic Materials. That's an independent institute derived from Tohoku University in Northern Japan. So through this partnership and the fact that Seiko has over 50 years of experience and know-how in manufacturing hairsprings in-house, Right, we were able to develop this new material with ultra high elasticity, corrosion resistance, and temperature resistance. The hardness of this brawn is also very high. And it has double the shock resistance of the previous generation. It also has high magnetic resistance. Right, it's three times that of the previous generations. And ISO standard in, in any watch to be anti-magnetic uh, is 4,800 amperes per meter. This Spron hairspring has over 10,000 in terms of uh, magnetic resistance. So this is really, really good for a metal spring.
So to showcase the excellent resilience of the Sprom hairspring, I'd like to share a little brief demonstration by a certified gold level meister from our Grand Seiko studio Shizuku Ishii, Mr. Satoshi Hiraga. As you'll see, Mr. Hiraga stretches out this metal spring and stretches it out over four centimeters. Now, theoretically, it should stay unwound as a spiral, but he recoils perfectly flat. That is very impressive for a nickel cobalt based alloy spring. Another cool feature uh, about our 9S85 high beat 36,000 is that instead of adding more teeth to the fourth wheel and, and uh, the gear train, we include an intermediate escape wheel or a fifth wheel, right? And by doing this, it allows for the size of the teeth to be larger and it makes more stable in energy transmission as well as it uh, re reduces any potential slipping. So it also helps reduce the wear that would typically occur on the fourth wheel. So this is uh, very beneficial for us in terms of energy efficiency and longevity. So the other trait I'd like to touch on is not just for the 9S8 series, but for basically all Grand Seikos up until now, uh, up until 2020. And that's the use of a regulator, right? The, leg, the regulator shortens or lengthens the active length of the hairspring, which in turn speeds up or slows down the rate respectively. And the regulator and its pin, it's, it's a great feature because it allows a wide range of adjustments to be made to the rate and the isochronism. And it's easy to adjust for almost any watchmaker when needed, right? So first you'll see the stud that holds the end of this hairspring. So by moving this, you can adjust the beat area. Next is the regulator arm itself in which the hairspring feeds into. And um, by moving the, the regulator arm, you're adjusting the active length of the hairspring. So this is uh, what's essentially either shortening, uh, shortening the length of the hairspring to make the reed speed up or making it longer to slow it down. By adjusting the regulator pin, you can adjust the isochronism. And then last, you'll see the micro adjustment pin or screw for the fine tuning of the rate. So the 9S8 series high beat 36,000 was introduced in 2009, but in 2010, a complete replacement was introduced for the 8 beat uh, 9S5 series, All right? So the 9S65, which was based on the 9S67, uh, had a lot of the same design traits. However, it was upgraded to the latest Spron spring alloys. Yes, it had the 72 hour uh, power reserve from the latest Spron mainspring, but also the hairspring was upgraded to the same Spron material used in the high beat. So higher grade material in the 9S65. And then we also introduced MEMS into the escapement for the 9S65 series back in 2010. So that was uh, not included in the 9S67. So this was uh, the first time we had utilized MEMS in an 8-beat caliber. And then in 2014, we developed our second iteration of the 9S8 series, which was a GMT, the 9S86. And uh, we were very honored that uh, in 2014, it was recognized at the Grand Prix de Horology of Geneva for the Petite Gui Award, which is, at the time was the best under 8,000 Swiss francs. So huge honor for us. And, uh, you know, this is still one of the iconic Grand Seikos in, in our history. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the 60th anniversary for Grand Seiko, right? It's a big year for us. We turned 60. It's really an incredible time for the brand. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in Japan, 60 is a very special birthday or an anniversary, right? It's a celebration of Kanreki. This is the completion of a full Zodiac cycle. And when you turn 60, you typically put on this red vest and this special red hat, and you celebrate with this red in order to symbolize birth or rebirth, right? That's the significance of the red. So for Grand Seiko, 
this is our Conrecki celebration. So let's break out the red hat and vest and we'll celebrate like we should. Now, you've probably seen this year, we've been celebrating like crazy. We've introduced a, a great amount of very cool limited edition models featuring Grand Seiko blue and red. Uh, but it wasn't just you know the blue and red color combo that made this year special. We're celebrating our rebirth, right? This is the dawn of a new horizon for our brand. And in doing so, we launched some very interesting, very innovative, and especially unique new calibers. All right, so at this time, I am pleased and very pleased to welcome Mr. Akio Naito to speak. If you attended our lecture last year in person uh, on Spring Drive, you may recall that he is the chairman and CEO of Grand Seiko Corporation of America. You may have also recently read that Mr. Naito oversees the rest of the international markets outside of Japan for both Grand Seiko and Seiko businesses. He also serves currently as, uh, concurrently, excuse me, as Deputy Chief Operating Officer for Seiko Watch Corporation, Chairman of the newly established Grand Seiko Europe SAS, on top of being Chairman of Seiko Europe DV, as well as Seiko UK LTD, and he is also a member of the Board of Directors for Seiko Subsidiaries. Uh, if that's not enough, as of July, he's responsible for all of the marketing and communications for both Grand Seiko and Seiko, and that includes the Japanese market. So he has more business cards and titles than any of us would know what to do with. And uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome Mr. Akio Naito. Thanks, Joe, for reminding me of all my titles, which I tend to keep forgetting. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be back and honored uh, to be a part of uh, HS NY lecture series. As Joe just mentioned, after 60 years since its birth, we are entering into a new era for Grand Seiko. I hope you'll be interested in our new technologies, amazing new technologies, the development of which you were able to accomplish uh, in time for this uh, anniversary year. In addition, the innovative technology, which we also invested in a, a unique studio uh, for Grand Seiko, representing the brand philosophy, the nature of time. So this is a very significant year for our brand. Some people in the audience may have be maybe familiar, already familiar with our Shizuku Ishi studio in Northern Japan, or it may even have visited there. This year, we just opened three months ago, a brand new studio in the same premises, which we named Grand Seiko Studio Shizuku Ishi. This studio represents the philosoph brand philosophy of the nature of time, as I just mentioned. And the studio is basically a wooden structure, clean room, which is very rare, designed by internationally renowned Japanese architect, Kengo Kuma, who also designed the new Olympic Stadium in Tokyo. Under the COVID-19, we are unable to welcome the public visitors, but I'm certainly hoping that in the very near future, you will have an opportunity to see our studio in person. Many windows of this studio allow the craftsmen and women access to the beautiful view of the surrounding beautiful nature, such as Mount Iwate. So I'd like to share with you a brief video introducing this new studio. Thank you. 
建物の屋根を、まあ、どういうふうに周りと関係づけるかって跳ね上げることでやはりその空とか岩手山とかそういうものと建物をつなげようっていうジェスチャーが気持ちがあそこに表れてました。木の移り変わりっていうのか季節感がとってもある場所なんですね新流の世界を迎えていわゆるもうなんかこうワクワクしてくる感じそこからまた次に紅葉になってまた葉が落ちて雪景色が出てくるっていう像っていうのはこうリズムが大事なのでこの林の木のリズムそれからこの柱のリズムそれから壁の山とばりもあれリズムなんですねそういうリズムが全部こう合わさってでまあそれこそ時を刻むようなこうリズムが建物の中にもあればいいなっていうふうに思ったのでえそれうまくいったと思います。グリーーンルームがあそこまでシンプルにするって一番難しいんですね。で照明の扱いとかその床からの空調とかですねそういうものを含めて、えー、実は現代の最高の技術を使ってあのシンプルさが実現している会社にはマイスター制度という制度がありまして経験と部下を育成するそういった力とそういったものをトータルで評価しながら3つの段階に合わせて最後はゴールドマイスターという資格を与えてそこには本人のプライドもありますしいいものを作ると同時に人も育てるのが自分の仕事だということを強く自覚することになる、それが一番のまあ意義じゃないかなというふうに思いますね。日本人がずっと長い年月かけて育ててきた匠の精神というのがグランド成功のものづくりには生きていて、それのある種詰まったものがグランド成功の匠の中にあると思って、その日本人の匠を育てたのは日本の自然である。でその日本の自然の美しい中で匠の技が発揮されてものが生まれていくっていうそのプロセス自身がここで感じていただけるんじゃないかなと思います。最高峰っていろいろ言い方あると思うんですけど、まあ制度もそうですし、実用する中で一番使いやすくて最高のもの、これはグランド成功なんだと。I hope you enjoyed the video. This project began approximately three years ago, and the studio has been created with a view to expand our production capacity to meet with the growing demand globally. Although there will not be an instant increase in our production capacity, because it takes years to train qualified watchmakers. Uh, who can build Grand Seiko, but it is our intention to gradually increase our production capacity. The very first caliber released from this new studio is the new 9SA5. It took nearly a decade to develop the caliber, which has many new and great features. As a pinnacle of the mechanical movements used for Grand Seiko. While I will let Joe explain the intriguing technologies behind this caliber, I'm excited to tell you that the new movement will be the foundation upon which a whole new generation of Grand Seiko mechanical watch models are to be designed. I hope you will be excited as well. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Naito. So there you have it. All right, this is the new home of the 9S Mechanical Grand Seiko. It's pretty impressive. The 9S A5 caliber. Is one of the first to be born from this new studio, and without question, is the finest caliber that Grand Seiko has ever made. And we announced earlier this year that this、uh, will be introduced as a limited edition of 100 pieces in 18 karat yellow gold. And then last month, we announced that we'll be doing a limited edition of 1,000 pieces in stainless steel. And I know a lot of people were very excited about that. 
So as Mr. Naito mentioned, we're very excited to show you more featuring this new caliber as time goes on. The movement was designed by Hisashi Fujieda. He was also in, uh, involved in the development of the 9S85, or actually developed the 9S85, as well as a, a many of the 9S6 series movements. The goal was to achieve high accuracy through high frequency, but retain the high longevity and durability of the 9S85, while also improving the duration as much as possible. Mr. Fujieda had quite the interesting challenge ahead of him. So he looked to the past to embrace his future. Specifically, he looked at one of the finest mechanical calibers from the early days of Grand Seiko, the 45 GS. From a design perspective, you can see some elements that were taken from the 45 GS, such as a balance bridge, uh, as an example, that have influenced its design. Mr. Fujieda's goal was to create the best Grand Seiko caliber ever in the brand's history. And he was determined, and after long, nine years, uh, his goal has finally been achieved. So the 9S A5 was launched, and it achieved its goal through three main points. First, and probably most notable aspect of this new caliber, is an entirely newly designed escapement we call the dual impulse escapement. The overall goal of the dual impulse escapement is to deliver energy to the balance wheel both indirectly as you would find in a conventional lever escapement and also to deliver energy directly to the balance more similar to what you would find in a detent escapement. So not only by uh, providing the energy like this, right, this dual impulse, but also to do it ultra efficiently right, with as little energy as possible. So really, the goal is to have constant energy supply to improve the performance while also doing it as efficiently as possible. So there's three major components, and I'm sure they sound very familiar, right? There's the escape wheel, the pallet fork, and the balance roller. Now, the names of these parts may be the same as you're used to hearing in a conventional lever escapement. However, they are very different in terms of their design, and they are very far from conventional. You may have noticed the intricate design, which of course is created by MEMS uh, for the escape wheel. So aside from the skeleton shape, another peculiar, th peculiar thing about this uh, escape wheel is it only has eight teeth, right? Most escape wheels generally you'll see like 15 to 20 teeth. This design helps improve the efficiency of the escapement overall. And if you look closely at the ends of each tooth, there's that same step design, right? just like you would see in the 9S8 series, which is used for lubricant retention. The pallet fork, which is also formed by MEMS, is a completely unique shape. The reduction of the weight is substantial, right? so it's a very lightweight pallet fork. This is thanks to the hollowed out design, and of course, this contributes to its overall efficiency. Now, what's also neat is that the Y shape of this pallet fork also allows for the use of only one banking pin, right, as opposed to the more common two that you would see in a conventional lever escapement. Now, the combination of this component along with the escape wheel allows for an improved efficiency already uh, over the already highly efficient 9S8 series. Right? It's, this is improved upon over the 9S8 series by 20%. It's a substantial improvement in energy efficiency. So here we're looking at the layout of these components, right? So we have the escape wheel and working uh, counterclockwise, we have the pallet fork, or it's clockwise, excuse me, the banking pin, the balance roller, and then on the balance roller, you'll see the impulse pin, which uh, you'll find on a lever escapement. You'll also notice the roller pallet. So that's not generally found on a lever escapement. So I'd like to walk you through the functionality of this and 
you know, it's high beat. So it would be moving much faster. So I'm going to do it in really slow motion just to make it easier. Uh, of course, you know, no one wants to watch this in ultra high speed. Maybe we do, but we're doing it in slow motion. And uh, we'll start with this locked position of the escape wheel and pallet fork. And as the balance turned in the counterclockwise direction, it moved the pallet fork using the impulse pin where the entry pallet stone, as you see here, has stopped the escape wheel tooth. As the balance turns back around clockwise, it moves the pallet fork, releasing the escape wheel tooth. And as you will see, the next tooth on the escape wheel makes contact with the pallet jewel on the roller. This provides a direct impulse of energy to the balance wheel. As that occurs, the escape wheel then goes into the locked position, this time by the exit pallet jewel. And as the balance roller comes back around, it moves the lever via the impulse pin. And an indirect impulse of energy is delivered to, uh, from the tooth to the sliding surface, the, uh, the impulse plane of the pallet jewel, the exit pallet jewel. So here you can see the indirect impulse being delivered to the bottom jewel at the bottom of the screen, sliding across that motion. And then that delivers the energy up through the pallet fork, out the fork end and to the impulse pin, in turn, delivering energy to the balance. Right? This is what you would find in a lever escape. So, this allows for the energy to be delivered on every beat of the balance once directly as you would find in the lever escapement once in uh, once directly as you would find in uh, detent escapement. Right? The amplitude remains high for every beat and the higher performance and stability is achieved. Now also another feature is a safety mechanism and this is to prevent any disturbance uh, from the functionality of it due to shock. Right? It's common in lever escapements but you wouldn't find uh, so much in detent. So should shock occur and disturb the uh, position of the pallet fork, the horns of the pallet fork and the guard pin or guard dart uh, prevent the pallet for, uh, fork from coming out of place during the balance's swing. So this is a secure mechanism as well. So overall, you have a safe, ultra highly efficient escapement that provides both direct and indirect energy to the balance in each beat. So much of the nine years of the development of the 9SA5 was in creating this new, very unique, and I must say myself, awesome escapement. I hope you enjoyed this little animation, and I hope it helped make sense of our new dual impulse escapement. Now, one of the other things you may have noticed about uh, this new caliber is the balance itself has completely changed. And for the first time ever in a Grand Seiko, we have added a free sprung balance. But it wouldn't be Grand Seiko if it wasn't unique. So the Grand Seiko free sprung balance, though has no regulator, it does actually allow for greater adjustments than you would find in a conventional free sprung balance. So this incorporates a newly developed overcoil as well which is a first for Grand Seiko also. So the free sprung balance removes the need for a regulator. And uh, just real quick, the downside of the regulator is if shock occurs, there's likely uh, adjustment to the arm that could occur involuntarily. So it, shock is uh, more susceptible in the, um, in the regulator, right? So free sprung is more stable but you'll notice uh, there's four mean time screws. So these serve a similar purpose to the uh, micro adjustment pin or screw on a regulator balance, right? You can adjust the rate in small increments. Generally, however, you cannot do anything to adjust the isochronism aside from manually taking off the hairspring and adjusting it, which requires a lot of time and effort and work. This of course is something we needed to change.
So when Mr. Fujieda was developing the 9S A5, the ease of use and the serviceability was something that was greatly considered. Right? In this instance, the stud that holds the fixed end of the outer terminal curve can actually be rotated. And that will adjust the isochronism. So this brilliant new patented feature allows for greater adjustments overall in this new caliber, in this new free sprung balance. So this is a new breakthrough that, uh, that we've included in this 9S A5. So moving on to the hairspring. This is the adjustment of a flat hairspring, but in this new uh, caliber, we're utilizing an overcoil. And manual adjustment of the hairspring is something that's been a key part of Grand Seiko since the beginning, right? Of attaining great rates. And it's necessary for us to be able to, to meet the strict Grand Seiko standard testing criteria, which all of our mechanical watches go through. So the craftsmen or women of the Shizuku Ishi studio that you saw building the movements, they're responsible for the adjustment of this 0 0.02 millimeter thick hairspring. And they use a special set of tweezers to make adjustments within tolerances of one hundredth of a millimeter. And each Grand Seiko watchmaker is trained to do these uh, adjustments on this craft. And they're required to adjust the spring to be a perfect spiral in the vertical position and then perfectly parallel in the horizontal position. And it is a tedious task. When the balance is being spun on a truing caliper, as you see here, right, it will look as if it has concentric waves, right? It looks like it's ripples in the water. And that's how you know when you have a finely adjusted hairspring. So incorporated into the Grand Seiko free sprung balance is the new Grand Seiko overcoil. So the overcoil was originally developed by Abraham Louis Breguet in 1795. And when compared to a flat hairspring, contributes to the, uh, the hairspring spiral concentric shape during its expansion and contraction. So we used flat hairsprings in Grand Seiko up until now. Um, and that was based on the skill set that we had. We become so good at adjusting them, and overcoils are one difficult to to manufacture, but two, we already had attained such great rates with flat hairsprings due to our adjustments that we didn't necessarily pursue it secretly. Of course, we've been pursuing it over the course of the last near decade. So, there's probably a couple hundred different types of overcoils in the world, and this year Grand Seiko added its own. Mr. Fujieda, uh, during the development of this, spent over two years determining the best analytical technique, meaning uh, creating an analytical software, uh, basically to test and determine the best shape for the overcoil. Right? After 80,000 different designs and simulations, he determined the perfect shape for the unique Grand Seiko overcoil. So these overcoils are created by utilizing a, a new jig to create the initial shape. And then the rest is adjusted completely by hand, utilizing the many years of experience and skill from the craftsmen and women of the Shizuku Ishii studio. The third contributing factor for the 9S A5 was the horizontal gear train. So this feature allows for a movement that not only has more features, right, is more innovative and, and technically interesting, uh, but it's also reduced in overall thickness by 15%. See, it's a part of Grand Seiko's watchmaking philosophy to make components that are durable and have high longevity. 9S A5 is no different. In many cases, it's best to have thick bridges and main plates in order to achieve high longevity and durability. It's important for 9S, to, 9S A5 to remain as durable as the 9S 85 despite the fact that the 9S85 is one millimeter thicker, which should theoretically make it easier. So how were we able to achieve this is the big question. And one of the ways is by having all the gears in the gear train fall in parallel with the barrels in the ratchet wheel. So this horizontal gear train, as we call it, right, allows us to reduce the overall thickness without compromising its durability. So you may have also noticed we're utilizing two barrels in this caliber. So through our twin barrel design, coupled with our very highly, ultra highly efficient MEMS manufactured dual impulse escapement, 
we're able to achieve an 80 hour power reserve in a watch with a high frequency, this high heartbeat of 36,000 beats per hour. This is over a 45% increase in duration compared to the 9S8 series. The diameter of the 9S A5 is slightly larger than the 9S8 series, which allows the two barrels to be laid out in parallel. And these barrels, they wind up and unwind simultaneously using two thinner, longer springs than used in the 9S8 series. So there's also some added features of the 9S A5 that you may not have read about yet. So one of which is an adjustable balance bridge. So for you Grand Seiko connoisseurs, yes, it's a balance bridge. And realistically, you're probably only familiar with two Grand Seikos that have ever used a balance bridge in the brand's history, which would be the 44 and 45 GS. Now the 9S A5 is included in that. And uh, you may, if you're uh, paying attention to our ladies caliber, the 9S27 also utilizes a bridge as opposed to a balanced cock. So fixed at both ends. So the use of this adjustable height in the balance bridge is uh, to basically, you know, the bridge itself is to help stabilize and, and increase the durability. But for a watchmaker, the adjustable height is a huge benefit. Right? It allows you to adjust the end shake of the balance staff. And typically you would have to adjust the position of the jewels in order to do so. With this feature, you don't have to do that. So it makes it easier for the watchmaker. Something else that we've done, uh, which hasn't been seen on a Grand Seiko mechanical movement yet, we actually do in our 9F quartz, is uh, an instantaneous date. So this new and highly durable mechanism allows us to have a date change that will change in 0 0.015 to 0 0.02 seconds. And some of the components utilized in this system are manufactured through MEMS as well. Another interesting feature is the crown itself. The crown is positioned lower and it's closer to the, it's closer to the rotor, closer to your wrist. And this actually makes it feel more secure and stable on your wrist. So not only that, but we did a new design to the keyless works. So when you're manually winding the 9S A5, it actually feels like a manual wind watch, despite the fact that it's automatic. The other notes on the design. If you know a little bit about Grand Seiko, you know nature is in our DNA. While the 9S85 is beautifully finished in line gradation stripes, a different method was approached for the 9S A5 caliber. And we wanted to have a more matte finish where uh, 9S 8 series, the finishing is, is very highly polished, very deep and angular. Um, this is more matte brush. And that's to provide a high contrast with the uh, beveling around the edges of all the bridges. So in order to create this contrast, this interplay of light and shadow, which is a traditional Japanese aesthetic that we implement in all of our watches design, right? We looked at the nearby Shizuku Ishi River and the ripples of the river inspire these new ripples in our striping, these Shizuku Ishi River stripes. Also, the design of this new caliber, it actually outlines Mount Iwate and the bend in the Shizuku Ishi River both of which are visible from our manufacturer. So as Mr. Naito explained, the new studio Shizuku Ishii is now open. Hopefully things calm down in the near future and we can start accepting public tours, which will be possible by appointment, of course. But as you go through the studio, as we do our virtual tour at the moment, You'll see our small team of craftsmen and women crafting GS in our new high-grade clean room. And upstairs, you'll see this beautiful and comfortable lounge overlooking the stunning and very impressive Mount Iwate. Inside the lounge, you'll find our new concept creation. This is the T0 Constant Force Turbion. So while many think the T and T0 is in reference to the tourbillon, 
it's actually in reference to the torque. So T0 is when a watch is in its fully wound state, right? So zero basically re represents the quantity of hours passed from full wind of the mainspring. Right? T24 would mean that the power reserve has been depleted for, 20 out for 24 hours from full. So the T0 is a concept caliber, right? It's not a production movement, so it doesn't necessarily have to follow the normal rules and regulations that come along with being a Grand Seiko creation. In fact, there was virtually total creative freedom given with the development of this piece. There's no concerns about the production capacity or capabilities, no concern about the price. The only one simple goal was to create the most accurate watch possible. And the T0 did just that. So the concept of using the tourbillon and a cor uh, constant force mechanism is not unique to Grand Seiko, first and foremost. I know there's been some confusion online. Great watchmakers, just like uh, F.P. Jorn or Andreas Strayer, who both lectured at the uh, Horological Society as examples, have made watches of the same nature. However, what makes ours unique and distinct is the fact that both mechanisms are fully integrated as one unit, right? And rotating around the same fixed wheel or the same axis. This isn't the only thing that makes the T0 unique, but also as we have learned today, frequency is very important, right? That heartbeat is everything. So for the T0, it's the highest frequency ever used in a watch containing a constant force mechanism. 28,800 beats per hour. So the culmination of this high frequency and a delivery of constant torque to the balance once per second, as well as the tourbillon mechanism, which is there to counteract the effects of gravity on the balance. And this, that's actually a substantial part, uh, has a substantial impact on improving the performance between the horizontal and vertical positions. So that's what helps it equate to the most precise caliber ever made in Grand Seiko's history. Where the VFA uh, is certainly one of the tops, this impressive new caliber has been tested within 0 0.5 seconds per day. Right? Now, these rates are the results based on a two-week wear test of this one prototype. It is, it is a concept caliber, but it is very impressive nonetheless. So while this movement's very beautiful to look at, the other sense of beauty in T0 is actually the sound it produces. The T0 is the only watch to produce this particular heartbeat. So if you listen closely, you can hear the one second beat of the constant force mechanism, along with the sound of the beating heart of the escapement at four hertz, producing the feeling of a 16th note. This is one of the first public views of the, uh, of the T0 in action, by the way. So the T0 focuses on energy efficiency. It's an important trait to all Grand Seiko calibers. Right? It utilizes two barrels with high torque in order to drive this uh, gear train and this constant force tourbillon to achieve a power reserve of 72 hours. Right? This would typically, the, the constant force tourbillon mechanism would typically be very heavy. And we utilize titanium, which is treated blue by anodic oxidation, uh, for the carriage arms of, of this mechanism. So the weight was reduced to improve the efficiency. Right? Also, not only the escape wheel and pallet fork are created by MEMS, but also a vast majority of the wheels and the gear trains uh, are created by MEMS to help aid in the efficiency as well. So now I'm going to give you a breakdown, right? No one's really seen this yet, so I'm excited to, to share this with you, is a breakdown of the constant force tourbillon mechanism in T0. 
Here you'll see the fully integrated mechanism here. And we'll split it up to make it easy. All right, we've got the constant force mechanism on the left, the tourbillon on the right. If we break down the constant force mechanism, we can see in all mechanical watches, energy depletes from the mainspring and the energy supplied to the balance, it dwindles. This is just a natural part of a mechanical movement. This in turn reduces the amplitude, the isochronism, the rate, everything can be affected by this, this decrease in torque output. So a mechanism that can deliver constant force to the balance, despite how much energy is left in the mainspring, can achieve performance that will remain stable. It's a huge benefit. So constant force mechanisms have been around for hundreds of years. And while they can be costly and complex to make, they have been done in many different ways. Each is striving to achieve the same goal, right? Consistent delivery of energy. So in T0, the constant force spring, as you'll see here, builds up tension on an outer carriage as the carriage rotates around this fixed wheel that I've mentioned, you'll see momentarily. So from there, once per second, that energy is released through this ceramic stop wheel. So the ceramic stop wheel is released, the energy is dispersed, and then it builds up again. The energy is then delivered to the escape wheel, which in turn delivers it to the balance wheel, providing constant flow of energy. Now this also at the same time displays the seconds in a deadbeat motion, right? Jumping from second to second. All right, if we go back, now we can look at the tourbillon mechanism. The tourbillon carriage is essentially the inner carriage, meaning there's the outside carriage for the constant force mechanism. And the tourbillon carriage is beating 28,800 beats per hour. As the balance beats, the escape wheel's energy releases and the pinion of the escape wheel rotates around that same fixed wheel as the stop wheel of the constant force carriage. So while many consider a tourbillon more of an ornamental addition to a wristwatch, uh, their original purpose was to evenly distribute the effects of gravity on the balance by constantly rotating it around, generally about one full rotation per minute. Now, this would help in achieving higher accuracy and more consistent rates across varying positions as well as being in the same position all the time. So for the T0, uh, it's true that it has contributed greatly to the performance, especially in the uh, change from horizontal between uh, horizontal and vertical positions. So here I have for you a slow motion video of T0 in action. And I believe this is reduced by about eight times. So you can clearly see the balance operating. And the escape wheel is moving around the central axis. And on the left, you can see the white ceramic stop wheel. So this ceramic stop wheel, by the way, is made with micron level precision. So a stop wheel is generally uh, have a lot of wear because of the nature of the mechanism. But this ceramic is incredibly durable. And due to its ultra high precision in manufacturing, we're able to make it durable and long lasting. So it's also uh, difficult to incorporate a hacking mechanism into a tourbillon, yet we have done that with T0. So generally, the hacking mechanism would touch the balance directly. But in this instance, T0 is hacked, but you don't actually touch the balance wheel. When you hack the watch, and you'll see the energy is dwindling now, it actually stops the uh, inner carriage. So you can see the last bit of energy deplete as the uh, as it runs down, right? that last little bit of energy from the constant force. So when closing the crown, you'll notice that the balance jumps right back into play. And that's because that, uh, that same lever is actually providing a little kickstart of energy, a little jump of energy to the balance to restart it. And this type of mechanism, we actually utilized it in a similar mechanism in the 45GS, which I have brought up numerous times tonight. Originally, though, that mechanism was developed for a stopwatch made by Seiko for the Tokyo 1964 Olympics. So here you can see the close-up reverse side of the T0. 
right? And highlighted here, you can see the uh, lever and the ring for the hacking mechanism. And then here, you can see the fixed wheel, right? The center axis of which the escape wheel on the top and the ceramic stop wheel on the bottom are rotating around. So they're both rotating around the same silver wheel you see in the middle of the screen here. Now, in terms of design, and this is, this is really neat. Um, if you've been to Japan, you may notice some aesthetics that look familiar, right? in particular, this design. So the design of the three arm balance, which actually is a first for Grand Seiko, by the way, using three arms in the balance. Uh, this design is actually something you may have seen at a shrine. This symbol is called a tomoe and is one of several tomoe symbols. Uh, in this instance, is symbolizing water or a whirlpool. So it's kind of funny if you think about it because tourbillon in, uh, means whirlwind in French. So in this iteration, it's a tourbillon that is from a town named Shizukuishi. Now, Shizuku in Japanese means dripping water. So you have this whirlpool of water. I hope you see the tie there. So this subtle but noticeable design cue is not only utilized on the arms of the balance wheel, but also within the gear train itself. And it's a minute little detail that pays tribute to Shizukuishi. So this mechanism was in development over the course of the last roughly eight years. And its main goal is the same as every Grand Seiko, to achieve high accuracy with a distinct sense of beauty. In terms of the beauty of this caliber, it's done quite differently than what you have seen in any Grand Seiko before it. This is in part due to the creative freedom uh, that was allowed in this concept creation, but also uh, to, in order to showcase the beauty of this hand finished movement, that's another big contributing factor. It took about three months just to do the finishing for, for the T0. So I wanted to show off as much as possible. All right. So at this time, I am very excited and happy to introduce Mr. Takuma Kawachiya, who is the designer behind the very impressive T0 Constant Force Turbion. Thank you, Joe. And good evening, everyone. My name is Takuma Kawauchiya, the designer of the T0 Constant Force Tool Beyond. As there were a lot of difficulties in the development of the T0, I'm so glad and honored that I can finally share this creation with you today, after eight years from its very first idea. My pure aim was to create an ultra high precision mechanical watch. To achieve this, it was necessary to include both the constant force mechanism and the tool beyond. <clears throat> it was not my intention to create a highly complicated watch from the beginning. At first, I created a block sample consisting of the heart of the movement, two layered carriages, and the minimum gear trains needed to test if my idea works. I used as many parts from the current watches because I couldn't wait to try it out. T0 is eight vibration per hour. I believe the VPH rate is crucial to the watch's accuracy when wearing. <clears throat> if it was more than eight beat, it would be faster than the speed of a human's motion in daily life. By making it just eight beat, the motion of the wearer causes less destruction to the balance, making it possible to keep a stable high accuracy. We have tested T0 in many ways, drop test, vibration test, and magnetism test. <clears throat> and I actually did a wearing test for over one year. We are happy to report, <clears throat> report T0 passed all of them. For the T0, I have glued the hands myself, and it was quite difficult. I polished the surface of the hands again and again, then glued them by heating. Because of the shape and the volume, it was difficult to glue them evenly. You can tell 
they are quite different from typical ground sequel hands. As a movement designer, I love watch components, the beautiful gears and the beautiful vibration of the balance. I like to watch them all the time. In designing T0, I wanted to feature these beautiful components so that we can see them as a watch and to arrange them beautifully in a symmetrical layout. I love to look into and analyze all types of complication watches. I especially like the beautiful symmetrical layout of some of the tourbillon movements, and I wanted to design T0 like this as well. Although T0's construction is not simple, as a concept creation of Grand Seiko, I try to use simple lines and forms in the parts to make it understated yet impressive. I prefer designs developed to maximize function rather than a beautiful design without considering usability. This is what every Grand Seiko has in common. We use twin barrels in 9SA5 that work in series. The first barrel moves the second one, and the second barrel moves the center wheel via its spring and ratchet wheel. In T0, the two barrels meshes the center wheel at the same time. It's placed in parallel. So it doubles the torque of the barrel. So the twin barrels in 9SA5 are for longer power reserve, while T0's twin barrels are for the stronger torque. Since this construction causes huge friction on the wheel teeth and the axis, I decide to coat the second and the third wheel with a special material to reduce the friction and to utilize a gear with a larger module to reduce the pressure cast onto the wheel teeth. Okay, um, to help you learn about me and what led to my career, I majored in engineering. My graduate thesis was very unique. It was about how to improve the design of the dashboard of the Shinkansen bullet train. But after I graduated from university, I tried hard to be a professional musician as a guitarist. Until 30, I tried very hard, but eventually I gave up trying to be professional and began my journey into this watchmaking world. So I chose to enter the watchmaking school. It was a watch-step school in Japan, in Tokyo, run by Rolex. I enjoyed learning watchmaking so much, but my school was very, very strict. I had 11 schoolmates, but three of them were kicked out of the school because they didn't have good technique. So it was very strict, but I managed to survive, and I felt very lucky that I could graduate from that school. After two years studying watchmaking, I entered Seiko Instruments. I also think that it, it's an unbelievable career from an unknown musician to Grand Seiko designer. So I feel very lucky that I found my true vocation after I gave up on becoming a professional musician. Okay, I hope you enjoyed my story. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you both very much. Uh, just so everyone knows that uh, both Mr. Naito and Mr. Kawachia are uh, working on a holiday today. But uh, real quick before we go, I, Mr. Kawachia, I understand that the beautiful sound of T0 kind of lingers in your mind. Right. Would you mind sharing with everyone at Horological Society of New York your interpretation of T-Zero's beating heart? It's Kodo. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I love T-Zero's sound, I, and I think it's very beautiful, and I hope you, um, you love it the same way, too. <clears throat> 
Okay, um, my interpretation of T0 with my own voice goes like this. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> that was great. I guess at this time, we'll go ahead and start our uh, Q&A segment. So thank you again, Mr. Naito and Mr. Kawauchia, especially for coming in on a national holiday and uh, doing this great presentation. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Joe. That was an incredible lecture. And uh, thank you to, to Mr. Naito and Mr. Kawachia for joining us on the holiday and, and, and joining us so early in the morning. We, re we really appreciate it. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, I also wanted to just give some, uh, some good news, a quick announcement here. Tonight's lecture sets the record. We had over 400 people tuned in. It sets the record for the modern era of HSNY in terms of attendance for a lecture. So that's pretty cool. Uh, thanks for everyone that is joining us from around the world to, to make this happen. So we have a lot of questions tonight. We're not going to be able to get through all of the questions. Uh, but what we are going to do, it's similar to what we used to do in person after the formal part of the lecture concludes. Uh, so we would, we would used to have a, uh, like an informal Q&A session. We're going to be doing that on Instagram from, from now on. So, so later on this week, you can follow uh, us on Instagram and Joe will be answering some of the questions that we uh, won't have a time to, to complete tonight. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, our first question is from Sam Jurians Karn. Uh, Sam asks, since the current 9S8 beat and 10 beat calibers are both regulated to plus three minus five, what is the benefit of purchasing a high beat 9S caliber? Is the same Spron main and balance spring used in both the eight and 10 beat calibers? So, um, I can answer this one. Uh, basically, the so you have your, and I'm sorry if I'm misinterpreting the question a little bit, but uh, the Spron materials that are used, so the mainspring is certainly different between the 8-beat and the 10-beat caliber. Uh, they, they have to use uh, totally different mainsprings in order to achieve the faster frequency of the high beat. Um, the material for the hairspring, however, is, is the same between those two, the 9S85 and the 9S65, as an example. Um, in terms of the benefits, the faster pace, uh, obviously you get with the 9S65 series, uh, longer power reserve, but with the high beat, not only do you get a more unique movement because there's not as many companies making a, a 10 beat watch, um, but you also have higher stability, shock resistance and stuff like that, that comes along with that higher frequency. So as I mentioned many times tonight, you know, stability is key. And that's one of the, the main contributing factors on why to, why to go for a high beat when considering between the two. So I hope that helped uh, answer the question. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and let's go to a question about the T0. So this, just getting to the question here. Okay, so this is a question for Mr. Kawachia. Uh, Adam Friedman asks, in the T0, is the constant force mechanism a remontoir or is a remontoir simply one way of delivering constant force and the T0 presents another way? Um, I, um, my opinion is the T0's constant force tourbillon is a type of uh, remontoir. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, I, would, I would agree. All right. Thank you for that. And then uh, another question about the T0, and uh, I, I think you were mentioning, mentioning this before. Steve Lessler asks, how robust will the T0 movement be? Um, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, the T0 have passed um, several um, <clears throat> tests like a drop test, a vibration test. So I believe, um, I believe there will be no problem if you wear 
T0 on your list. Yeah, um, okay, I believe so. <clears throat> and he wore it firsthand, uh, keep in mind, and I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that he you know, knows his creation well. It probably didn't uh, get babied too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, having said, uh, coming up with a, you know, a concept model is one thing, and uh, making a production line and ensuring the quality control, that's completely another. <laughs> So don't get too excited that the production, commercial production won't come, you know, tomorrow. Okay, we have a, a question from Hamza Masood. Hamza asks, is there a dictionary for the Grand Seiko caliber and reference number assignments that also shows the development lineages? No. I don't think we have a complete, uh, you know, dictionary as such, but uh, uh, it's it's a, a great idea, and and perhaps we should consider making one. I agree. That's a, a great idea, Hamza. Okay, uh, we have a our next question. It's both a statement and a question. It's uh, it's a, from Scott Devine. Uh, Scott Devine. Uh, says he wants to live at the new Grand Seiko studio because it's so beautiful. And then he asks, how can anybody get anything done uh, because it's, it's such a beautiful uh, piece of architecture? Yes, I, I agree 100%. Actually, uh, I'm going to visit the uh, factory uh, Friday this week for, for the first time after its completion uh, because we were unable to uh, make a visit to uh, the premises because of COVID. We were very lucky to have Mr. Kengo Kuma design our studio. Uh, he is, as I said, a renowned architect, and he has done uh, quite a few works worldwide. And many of his works were inspired by, you know, very much similar to the nature of time. Uh, he uses natural materials like, such as wood. So uh, he really appreciated uh, Grand Seiko's brand philosophy. And also he is a big fan of Grand Seiko himself. So we were very lucky to have him design our studio. Okay, the next question is from Cormac Kinney. Cormac asks, how does the dual impulse escapement differ functionally and performance wise from a Daniels coaxial escapement? Obviously he says it looks different. It's, uh, it's a very great question and uh, kind of a long answer, but I'll try and abbreviate it as much as possible. Um, essentially, there's a, there's a lot of differences in terms of the overall aesthetic. Uh, one is the design of the escape wheel. There's no coaxial wheel, so it's not, uh, it's not the same in that regard at all. Um, in terms of the pallet fork, as an example, there's only two stones on the pallet fork, uh, which also is a, is a big separation from the coaxial design as well. So there's uh, those couple of aspects. The other aspect of it, I would say, is really just the more or less focus on energy efficiency um, and reducing overall weight. So that's, and that's part of the design schematic to help eliminate the weight is to is to get rid of the secondary wheel, to not need the secondary wheel, to not need the coaxial, as well as the additional stone on the pallet fork, and also um, to reduce overall size. So aside from that, uh, you'll notice also that there is an implementation that is more similar to a lever escapement uh, on our dual impulse uh, as when compared to coaxial. I hope that's helpful for you. There's quite a few differences though. Absolutely, it's very helpful. Okay, let's see. Next question is from Brian Standig. Brian asks, is it anticipated that the 9S A5 will be utilized and rolled out on a larger scale? What is the time frame expectation for that? I'm not even going to try, Mr. Knight. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, certainly it is our intention to design, uh, you know, many of our future Grand Seiko mechanical models based on this uh, new caliber. Uh, 
uh, it is a challenge for us, as I mentioned, to ensure the quality of uh, a production line uh, to be in line with the overall uh, Grand Seiko uh, standards. Okay, thank you for that. Wow, we have so many questions. This is uh, incredible to see so much, so much interest. Uh, next question is from Leon Fishman. Uh, Leon asks, uh, as mentioned early on in the presentation, Grand Seiko has been making beautiful watches and exceptional movements for some time. Within the vintage watch collecting circle, it is known that parts for Grand Seiko vintage pieces are very hard to come by. What is the appetite, if any, from Grand Seiko to provide service for heritage pieces? Uh, yes, it's a very good question. Uh, because the history of Grand Seiko goes back to having, uh, you know, intra-group competition, meaning two factories, uh, Suwa Seikosha and Daini Seikosha, we don't really have one integrated uh, historical archive of uh, the models as well as the, uh, each component. So it is a challenge for us to put them together to come up with the, uh, uh, the kind of program that we can offer to our uh, watch fans. But uh, uh, certainly it, it is in our interest to, uh, you know, as, as, we go, as, uh, as we go into the global uh, market as a global brand, uh, our intention to, is to streamline the history and, and come up with uh, such a program in the near future. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next, we will go to a question from Brendan Cunningham. Uh, this is uh, about the T0. Uh, Brendan asks, why does the tourbillon in the T0 use the traditional escapement, the Swiss lever escapement, rather than the, the new escapement that we discussed? Um, because um, I, I developed T0 before, um, before the, um, the team of 995 designed um, the movement. So um, <clears throat> when I designed um, T0, there was no dual impulse escapement yet. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one thing I, th I think I failed to mention and I should have is that, uh, you know, they were kind of developed uh, around the same time. If you remember in the in the lecture, uh, eight years of development of, of T0 alongside of 9SA5, uh, about a little, maybe nine years. So they were kind of, uh, they refer to them as, as brother movements. But, um, but yeah, there wasn't uh, that interaction. Okay, next up, uh, we have a question from uh, John Davis, the Vice President of the Horological Society of New York. Uh, John asks, in the 9SA5, how can the patented rotating stud mechanism alter the isochronism without compromising the rate adjustment between vertical positions? The technical question. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read it again. Uh, so in the 9SA5, how can the patented rotating stud mechanism alter the isochronism without compromising the rate adjustment between vertical positions? This one, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to. We, we, we will have to get back to you later. <laughs> we have no to study. We'll, yes. we'll get. <laughs> we had Mr. Fujieda here, then we might be able to answer it on the spot, but unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, right. Fair enough. Uh, it's a, a very, very technical question, which John yes. is known to ask. We appreciate it. Oh, maybe we'll have to answer it through uh, Instagram or something. There, you know, there may be also uh, because of the patented nature of the uh, of the stud itself, and and also the shape of the overcoil. Uh, there is some information that's not publicly disclosed, uh, myself included. So, you know, this is uh, something we have to keep in mind as well. 
Okay, so we have an, another question about the T0. Uh, Mike Major asks, the T, uh, he, first he says the T0 is very impressive. Then he asks, what lessons did you learn that could be brought into mass production? As I mentioned in the presentation, I, um, okay, uh, T0 has a um, pre sprung balance that has um, um, regulating knot um, instead of the mean time screw. And uh, <clears throat> I, I tried mean time screw, uh, mean regulating knot because it was um, more rare and unique. And uh, I, I knew that it wouldn't be easy to use regulating nut, but I took the challenge, but um, it was actually very difficult um, to control the torque. So um, maybe if it will be um, into production, uh, I'm considering using uh, mean time screw instead of regulating nut, but um, it, it just in my mind, yeah. Well, just to uh, supplement or add to his answer, uh, as you can see, Mr. Kawauchiya is a humble uh, engineer, so he, he wouldn't uh, tell everything uh, during his uh, uh, development process, but uh, uh, nearly, you know, for nearly 10 years, uh, he has worked on this uh, T0, and uh, uh, he has come up with so many great ideas which can be utilized in our future uh, pr uh, development of, uh, uh, you know, brother uh, or sister calibers. So uh, you can expect that Grand Seiko will come up with a number of uh, new uh, uh, calibers based on the concepts or uh, findings that he came up with the, uh, during the process of the development of T0. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, that makes me that makes me excited. Looking forward to, to seeing those developments. And we have another question about the T zero. Uh, first, a statement uh, from Logan Clark, uh, Mr. Kawachia. Congratulations on the T zero. It looks fantastic. Then he asked the question: Do you find your musical background being a big source of inspiration for creating new movements like the T zero? And will we see more musically inspired movements from Grand Seiko? Uh, okay. Um, at the moment, I um, I have uh, I don't have any ideas um, to make movement with um, musical um, sound yet. But um, in T zero, um, I. I tried hard to make the sound of T0 to an um, exact 16th note. So, um, so to make the sound 16th note, exact 16th note is very um, difficult when, um, so we have to um, make components very um, precise in dimension. So the sound is, um, is a proof of the the precision of watch components in T zero. Okay, thank you for that. Well, some some people may be familiar, but uh, we have a musically inspired CEO as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so next question is from Chris Marchis. And I think this is a question uh, for all three of you. He asked, what watches are on your wrist now? I have a 
sorry to say, Spring Drive. <laughs> it's a US only creation uh, for the establishment of Grand Seiko America two years ago. Okay. Um, my model on the list is a uh, first design for 9S55. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Mr. Kosugi san designed. I love this shape. Myself, uh, also uh, another Kosugi design is the um, 44 GS, the high beat GMT 9S86, very similar to what you saw when the Grand Prix de Horology Geneva uh, Petit de Gui Award. So this is, uh, I actually own this watch, two different versions, the same exact watch. There's a one that says Seiko, Grand Seiko on the dial, and then this version, which only says Grand Seiko. So uh, that's how much I love this piece. On my other wrist though, because um, I do that from time to time is a, uh, and it's not functioning, but you know, I still, I still love the feel is the new 9S A5 SB, uh, SLGH, excuse me, 003, which we just announced last month. So the, the form and feel of this watch is completely different than any other Grand Seiko uh, that I've ever had on my wrist. And I've had a lot on my wrist and uh, it's something very unique. So I'm excited for people to actually try on this new design. All right, thank, thank you all for, uh, for showing what's on your wrist. Uh, how, how are we doing? Should, should we? Uh, yeah, it's maybe two more, two more in. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, so here's another escapement question. Ratan Bari asks, how is the dual impulse escapement in the 9S A5 uh, when compared to others that have come to the market, such as the Charles Frodsham double impulse escapement or the Bernard Lederer central impulse escapement? Again, it goes back to the optimization of efficiency. That I think I think overall, when you talk about nine SA five, it shouldn't even uh, it, it just just the mention of efficiency alone is enough to describe what the goal of this movement is, right? To reduce weight, to improve the performance overall, is is really the goal, and uh, you know to keep even the design of the eight tooth escape wheel is in order to optimize the efficiency, reduce the weight, uh, eliminate the additional you know, uh, teeth in the wheel that would typically be there. So, I mean, that is what separates us from any other escapement, um, let alone you know, in terms of just the aesthetic of it. But functionality, um, I mean, the goal is kind of the same, right? The, uh, you know, to deliver constant energy to the balance. But our main target is more focused on improving the efficiency. So I hope that's uh, very helpful for you. Absolutely. Okay, and our last question for the evening is from Luca Morelli. Luca asks, uh, this is a question about the T0 for Mr. Kawachia. He asks, what CAD software did you use to design T0? <laughs> So, uh, um, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't um, specify the software. It's a kind of confidential. I'm sorry. That's that's no problem. Uh, I, I I appreciate the question from Luca, and I appreciate all of the questions that came in tonight. Uh, I I have the Q and A box here that it's open. We have 58 open questions, mm -hmm. so. If your question did not get answered tonight, follow the Horological Society of New York on Instagram. And later this week, we'll be answering more of the questions uh, that we didn't get a chance to address tonight. Uh, I want to th thank again, uh, Mr. Kawachia, Mr. Naito, and Joe Kirk for delivering this uh, incredible lecture tonight. Uh, it's really a, a record setting lecture. It's, it's one that we all can remember with over 400 attendees from all over the world. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining us. 
And I look forward to seeing you all again for our December lecture, our last lecture of, of 2020. Uh, that's going to be with Mr. William Andrews. Uh, he is a, an expert sundial maker. So we're going to be tackling a different aspect of horology in December. All right. So thank you all and uh, have, a, have a great night, a great afternoon, a great morning, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you in December. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.